Berlin's great day dawns with the arrival of the Olympic flame at the end of its 2,000 mile journey from Greece. And meanwhile a packed stadium and flag draped cheering streets greet Chancellor Hitler on his way to perform the opening ceremony. In the context of the chaos, carnage and turmoil of Nazism, what happened in Berlin in the first half of August 1936 is really no more than a footnote, or one which has left an indelible footprint on our perception of those times. What became known as Hitler's Olympics was probably the first global act of political propaganda. It defined the lives of both athletes and organizers and left a mark on the Olympic movement that can still be seen today. Kinder, the Spiele von Berlin. Zum Feier der ersten Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. The narrative has emerged where African American athletes Jesse Owens single handedly undermined the Nazi's ideology of racial hierarchy and the myth of Aryan superiority. The truth is far more complex. In the broader context of the games, what was happening on the track was merely a sideshow. The games came at the midway point of Hitler becoming German Chancellor and the start of World War II. The country's democratic structures had been dismantled. State-sanctioned violence was ruthlessly enacting the drive to isolate and expel the country's Jews. And it was six years before the Vansi Conference set the path of the final solution. Undoubtedly, the Berlin Olympics are a convenient lens through which to assess the stranglehold the Nazi party were exerting on the country. But from Hitler's perspective, they were the perfect opportunity to test the resolve of an onlooking world desperate not to revisit the carnage of the 1418 war. With the pigeons carrying a message of peace to the world, begins the event for which all Germany has been preparing for months past. For 14 days, Berlin will be the scene of the fiercest battles between 50 nations, battles of peace. For 14 days, the eyes of the world will be on Berlin and Germany wants to send away every one of her millions of visitors as a friend. In 1931, where Berlin was chosen over Barcelona to host the Olympic Games five years later, the German economy was in freefall. Constrained by the terms of the Treaty of Versailles and battered by the stock market crash of 1929, rampant unemployment fueled the forces of extreme nationalism. Karl Diem, former athlete, spearheaded the bid. For him, the Games were a way of reversing his country's post-war humiliation and hastening its acceptance back into the family of nations. He found willing allies in Henri de Belay Latour, the president of the International Olympic Committee, and German committee member Theodore Lewald, each wedded to the ideal of sport being a vehicle for promoting friendship and peace between nations. January the 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler was named Chancellor and by the end of March had granted himself full powers. The process of the suppression of personal freedoms accelerated apace. Within weeks, a disused munitions factory in Dachau became the Nazis' first concentration camp and began to fill with political opponents. To date, Hitler had shown little or no interest in sport, once dismissing the Olympic movement as a sinister plot by Freemasons and Jews. In fact, at best for him, they were no more than an inconsequential decadence. Diem Lewald arranged to meet the new Chancellor, prepared to argue hard for his endorsement. 
but it turned out the task was far easier than they'd expected. In attendance as well was Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister for propaganda. He quickly recognized how staging the games was the perfect way of announcing the regime's arrival on the international stage and an ideal way of connecting with the masses. Conscious of the negative coverage the emergent government was getting in the world's press, Goebbels astutely calculated that the majority of people would know little or nothing about their policies. By the end of the meeting, he and Hitler were intoxicated by the vision of a new Germany being portrayed as the meeting point for the peace-loving youth of the world. Within a year of the Nazi party coming to power, practically all of German life had been contaminated by the virus of overt anti-Semitism. Jews, who made up about three quarters of a percent of the population, were purged from the civil service, medical and legal professions, as well as the arts, media and film industry. Under the auspices of Goebbels Reich Chamber of Culture, every area of society was becoming Judenreich, free of Jews. In sport, Jewish athletes were denied membership of all foundations and clubs and excluded from competition with their Aryan counterparts. Conscious of how such discrimination was affecting world opinion and putting the games in jeopardy, the leadership declared that exclusively Jewish sports organizations would be allowed to remain open. In the years building up to the games, the inevitably inferior training facilities and ban on official competition successfully thwarted the aspirations of potential German Jewish Olympians. But Gretel Bergman was different. Age 16, she became German high jump champion a year before the Nazis came to power and, as the games approached, became the sporting world's barometer for gauging her country's treatment of Jewish athletes. Uh, there was one incident where uh, in the New York papers they wrote about that I was not allowed to compete in the uh, German championships. So the German sports organization was uh, questioned, why wasn't she allowed? Oh, she couldn't compete because she doesn't belong to the German Track and Field Association. But why wasn't I allowed to, to you know, I wasn't allowed to be a member because I was Jewish. So they, they, they got around everything in a very sneaky way. And uh, as I said, they got whatever they wanted to do, they did whichever way they could get, get to it. The authorities weren't that concerned about concealing the true cynicism of their intentions. In an official declaration about their policy on Jewish sports participation, they had stated that a general regulation for Jewish sports will come out after the end of the Olympics. The Nazis clearly didn't crave world approval, but they were nonetheless mindful of how their policies were perceived abroad. The Olympics was an opportunity to detoxify the brand. Projecting the image of a progressive, modern, peace-loving nation was the perfect way of concealing their expansionist, militaristic ambitions, diverting attention from the rapidly accelerating rearmament program. Moves to boycott the Olympics were growing, most notably in America. For close observers of Hitler's regime, the case for refusing to take part in what was clearly going to be a charade on purely moral grounds was a no-brainer. But to Avery Brundage, the president of the American Olympic Committee, moral considerations were irrelevant. 
Brundage publicly supported German assurances that Jewish athletes would be able to compete in the Olympic trials via the exclusively Jewish sports clubs. Organisations that his close friend and German representative of the International Olympic Committee, Karl Ritter von Holt, had described to him as subversive fronts for Jewish communist agitation that would never be permitted to send athletes to the trial. In the summer of 1934, Brundage was dispatched to Germany to assess the situation in person. A six-day visit hosted and choreographed by Karl Ritter von Holt, where he met with carefully selected Jews under close SS supervision who spoke glowingly of life in Nazi Germany. The fact is that the Germans didn't need to work too hard to win him round. He openly admired the way the regime marginalised opponents. During the visit, Brundage even spoke of how his own sports association denied Jews and Blacks membership. This was a man who would eventually describe the Olympic Games in Berlin as a great festival of the youth of the world arranged and controlled entirely and exclusively by non-Nazis for the benefit of non-Nazis. On his return, Brundage officially accepted the invitation to participate in the Games on behalf of the American Olympic Committee. The American Olympic Committee, composed of the representatives of 70 leading amateur sport governing bodies, unanimously accepted the invitation to participate after full investigation. And he wasn't short of allies. The secretary of the British Olympic Association, Colonel Evan Hunter, responded supportingly by saying, my own view is that we are pandering too much to the Jew. Deep-rooted shared notions of racial superiority held by men and it was always men in positions of power, whether they were sports officials or political leaders, reinforced a divisive hierarchical view of the world. A meaningful analysis of these events can only be made through that prism of race. In the interwar years, racially charged attitudes that today we like to hope are consigned to the fringes were part of mainstream discourse. Ideas such as racial hygiene and the notions of mixed marriages, contaminated so-called pure blood, were widely held. Beliefs rooted firmly in the grubby racist reality of generations of European colonialism and the global slave trade. A year before the Olympics in the summer of 1935, Berlin hosted the International Congress for Population Science. It was attended by social theorists from across the world. Reich Minister Wilhelm Frick greeted delegates with a message from his Führer wishing the conference success in its important work in the weighty sphere of population policy and race cultivation. The assembled experts discussed matters such as the evolution and improvement of populations, the banning of mixed marriages, and what one German contributor termed the delusion that all men are created equal, and went on to conclude, humans are determined by heredity. Biological or artificial ways had to be found that eliminated members of the population who were inadequately adapted to the natural competitive struggle of life. A month later, the German government put in place a pivotal part of the process that culminated in the Holocaust. The Nuremberg
Nuremberg Citizenship Laws, or to give it its proper title, the Law for the Protection of German Blood and German Honor. A legal framework legitimizing the alienation and expulsion of the country's Jews. It is an uncomfortable truth that Nazi lawmakers such as Wilhelm Frick, who was a signatory to the Nuremberg Laws, were close followers and admirers of the segregationist Jim Crow laws designed to marginalize African Americans. From the perspective of the black American Olympians, Germany was a relative newcomer to state-sponsored segregation. It is hypocritical to attempt to clean up conditions elsewhere before cleaning up similar conditions here at home, said sprinter Benjamin Johnson. Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes, the only black female members of the American Olympic team, had first-hand experience of overt racial discrimination. Four years earlier at the 1932 Los Angeles Olympics, just moments before the 4 by 100 meter relay final, they were cruelly dropped from the team. All they could do was watch from the stands as the new shiny white All-American Quartet took the gold medal. No one could have predicted that in Berlin, four years later, this callous act of discrimination would be repeated. It is a fact that when the Nazis were establishing the camp system where millions of Jews and others perceived as racially inferior would be murdered, scores of black Americans were being lynched across the southern states. But it's worth noting that at the official US trial for the Berlin Games, of the seven athletes lining up for the final of the 100 meters, only two, Frank Wyckoff and Foy Draper, would have been permitted to compete for Germany on racial grounds. Jesse Owen, Ralph Metcalf, and Mac Robinson were black, and Marty Glickman and Sam Stodder were Jewish. <laughs> February 36. The picture postcard Alpine Village of Garmisch Partenkirchen. The stage for Germany's Winter Olympics conjuring trick, where deception and sleight of hand would magically make rampant anti Semitism vanish before your very eyes. It was the perfect dress rehearsal for the main performance in Berlin later in the summer. Throughout the region, anti-Jewish signs were removed for the duration of the games. Locals were told to refrain from all anti-Jewish manifestations and comments until after the games had ended in order to avoid offending those whose features are non-Aryan looking. Strict instructions were issued for people to be as accommodating as possible. Etiquette lessons were given to waiters, guides and shopkeepers to ensure that racial issues were not discussed in public and a directive to offer up tram car seats to any foreign lady, no matter what her racial profile, appeared in local newspapers. 
And these games, like Berlin's, would come with a token German-Jewish participant, Rudy Ball, a star member of the German hockey team who only agreed to play when he received a guarantee that his parents would be allowed to emigrate to South Africa. Two weeks after the Olympic flame at Garmisch Partenkirchen was extinguished, Germany tested Europe's resolve by sending its troops into the Rhineland, flouting their existing peace treaty obligations. It was a calculated risk that was vindicated by the muted response it evoked from neighbouring leaders. This episode was probably the clearest possible example of the world's growing propensity to tolerate Nazi excesses. The decision to invest so heavily in this Olympian propaganda exercise was looking increasingly justified. Meanwhile, the last torchbearer has reached the stadium after the final run out from Berlin to light the Olympic beacon with fire carried from the scene of the old Olympic Games in Greece. Uh, I was chosen to be a member of that relay. I ran approximately at midnight uh, in a cornfield. It was a little windy and the flame started to jitter. And I prayed to God, I said, not for me. God forbid that darn thing goes out while I am running it, they will see a Jew did that on purpose. The first ever Olympic torch relay, where the mystique of ancient Greece was engineered to illuminate the contemporary myth of Arianism. 3,000 runners covered the 2,000 mile route through Greece, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Austria and Czechoslovakia, countries the Nazis would return to in the coming years. The sham atmosphere of tolerance that engulfed Berlin during the Games is often referred to as the Olympic pause. This is perhaps too passive a term for what was really happening. Putting the brakes on three years build-up of accumulated state-sponsored hatred and presenting an open, carefree face to the world with so much at stake was a highly monumental act of suppression and control that involved the entire machinery of the government. And shortly before the foreign visitors the journalists, the world press arrived in Berlin. Uh, Hitler made a speech and let it be known that he did not want, he wanted all anti-Semitic signs removed, he wanted all uh, the German press to be very careful not to print anything anti-Semitic, and Berlin became uh, 1926 rather than 1936. As the event approached, Gretel Bergman, the Jewish high jumper, became increasingly entangled in Germany's deception. She had been able to find refuge in England, where her talent fueled speculation that she might even compete in the Games for Great Britain. But then one day, her father paid her a visit in London. He told me that um the Germans had approached him that I had to come back to Germany to be on the uh, German Olympic team. And I said, why should I go back? I don't want to go back. And my father said, look, I don't force you into anything, but we were threatened. The family, still living in Germany, of course, uh, we were threatened that if you don't come back, you have to, you know, the consequences, they can't guarantee what's going to happen. So, of course, I went back. And so the preparations continued. 
Two weeks prior to the Games, the 600-strong Roma and Sinti population in Berlin were forcibly removed to an empty field totally devoid of any sanitary facilities in Majan, about six miles north of the city. Special operating licenses were issued ensuring that street food could only be sold by vendors who were politically reliable. Every night I was thinking, what would happen to me if I do compete? And do I have to stand up on that podium and say Heil Hitler like all the others? It was, uh, it was a terrible time for me. I mean, psychologically, it was very, very rough on me. And as happened six months earlier at Garmisch Partenkirchen in the Winter Games, all physical signs of anti-Semitism were removed from the streets. So they didn't want people to go back to their countries and say what, you know, the terrible things that are going on there. And uh, deception was, was rampant. Because then people go back and they say, Jews are complaining, there's nothing going on. What, what are they talking about, you know? And while Berliners were warming their welcomes, the largest ever number of Olympians were making their way to Germany from across the world. Most of the American athletes crossing the Atlantic aboard the SS Manhattan had never left their own shores before, let alone been on a luxury ocean liner. But for the 18 black members of the US Olympic squad, there was even more to adapt to. For most of them, stepping onto an American ship where all the communal areas were fully integrated, was in effect entering a non-segregated part of their country for the first time in their lives. As soon as the Americans were in the boat going over to, to Germany, the next day I got uh, the letter was addressed uh, on the 16th of July uh, that I wasn't good enough. I knew that I would not be allowed to compete in the Olympics. And uh, it would have been a terrible uh, for Hitler, you know, how, how, could, how would he feel to uh, have a Jew compete in the Olympics and uh, he, he couldn't afford to, to have me compete, let's put it that way. And I knew sooner or later they would throw me out or they would find a way for me not to, not to compete. The propaganda campaign was intended for domestic as well as external consumption. Filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl, famed for her highly stylized depictions of the early Nuremberg rallies, was hired to depict the games in the same grandiose manner. Her images dominate the way the games are remembered to this day but it's the original commentary that belies the film's true intentions. African-American athletes were crudely dehumanized throughout and their victories presented as proof of the racist pseudo-theory that black people were descended from animals. A warped worldview that sadly at that time was not exclusive to Germany. This perverse belief led many Nazis to see black participation in the games as somehow unfair. In his diary, Goebbels accused the uncultured Americans of cheating for including black athletes. It is a scandal to allow such abominations to compete in the civilized world, he wrote. White humanity should be ashamed of itself. He, Hitler, and other leading Nazi strategists often fantasized about the day when, in a Nazi-dominated world, the Olympic Games would be exclusively Aryan. Riefenstahl's footage of the long jump event is perhaps the most intriguing. An ecstatic Hitler is seen applauding German champion Lutz Long's new European record, but his reaction to Jesse Owens' subsequent winning world record jump is not recorded. 
Neither is his reaction to the remarkable footage of Long warmly congratulating his fellow athlete, or of the two men walking arm in arm in mutual respect after the medal ceremony. An unguarded act of genuine sportsmanship that has been widely eulogized ever since. It's often said that Hitler deliberately refused to congratulate Owens at the games. This is a commonly held misconception. The fact is, given the choice between congratulating every medal winner or none, he chose the latter. A decision which may well have been made for racist reasons. But what is indisputable? is that an invitation to attend a post-games presidential reception for returning U.S. Olympians at the White House was not extended to the 18 black members of the squad. This shameful snub was only officially addressed 40 years later when President Gerald Ford symbolically awarded Jesse Owens the American Medal of Honor. In isolation, these games were just a blip in the evolution of Nazism. Just another curiously interesting episode. But we know now what nobody could have imagined in 1936. We, we know the context, we know precisely what the genocidal conclusion to the Nazi mindset looked like. And knowing that behoves us to look a little closer, to scratch below the surface and see what's underneath that squeaky clean veneer of respectability. And there was plenty going on that was not captured by the lens of Lenny Riefenstahl's camera. Most nights, embassies and consulates across the city hosted receptions for their country's visiting athletes, where leading figures in the Nazi party basked in the glow of the organizational slickness of their games. And Goebbels and Goering, eager to capitalize on the Olympic spotlight of attention, competed with each other to stage the most extravagant event inviting guests to ride on a roller coaster in a custom-built funfair while enjoying the talents of the stars of Berlin's opera and ballet company. In attendance as well were British sisters Diana and Unity Mitford, personal guests of the Führer, who had provided them with a chauffeur-driven car for the duration of the games. Diana, the fiancé of Oswald Mosley, leader of the British Union of Fascists, was openly touting German allies for funding to support political activities back home. To the west of the city, in the luxurious athlete's village, competitors were being treated like royalty by an army of carefully chosen, highly attentive helpers. Few of the foreign visitors had any inkling that the primary purpose of these minders was to manage and control their interactions with the real Germany. There was a fully functioning post office where Gestapo's surveillance experts filtered out off-message communications. Particularly close attention was paid to any correspondence sent to Jesse Owens. Messages from former concentration camp inmates were smuggled into the village and secretly slipped under the bedsheets of less high-profile athletes, such as 16-year-old British high jumper Dorothy Odom. Understandably petrified at being caught with such a note, Dorothy immediately handed it to her minder. I felt it had nothing to do with me, she explained. But it did bring in the fact that there was something going on behind all the strutting and Heil Hitlers. Alas, coercion, manipulation and control were not the exclusive preserve of the hosts. Well, the morning of the day we were supposed to run the relay, all the sprinters 
were called into a meeting. They had very strong rumors that uh, the Germans were hiding their best sprinters and saving them for the 400 meter relay to upset the American team. And consequently, to meet this threat, Marty and Sam were going to be replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. That was a complete shock to all of us, including Jesse and Ralph. Jesse immediately spoke up and said, Coach, I've won my three gold medals, the 100, the 200, and the long jump. Let Marty and Sam run. They deserve it. And the coach said, pointed the finger at him and said, you'll do as you're told. And so Sam and I were taken off the team the morning of the day we were supposed to run. The American team won the race by 15 yards. Now 15 yards at 400 meters is like from now until next Tuesday. So what the American coaches said was a complete lie, a fabrication made up to get the Jewish, two Jewish kids off the team. Indisputably allowing two Jews to receive gold medals in such a high profile event would have profoundly embarrassed the German hosts. Predictably, decades of denial, silence and indifference has buried the precise source of the injustice meted out to Glickman and Stoller so reminiscent of the way that Stokes and Pickett were treated four years earlier in Los Angeles. But they weren't the only Jewish competitors to be so callously manipulated. The conundrum of German Jewish fencer Helena Mayer, a gold medalist from previous Olympic Games, reverberates to this day. She became the token Jew, the cosmetic compromise that paved the way for America's participation in the Games. And it's important to differentiate her from Gretel Bergman. Mayer had one Jewish parent, but she didn't identify as such. She never publicly condemned the system that prevented her from competing in her own country forcing her to pursue her career in America. She was an ultra-focused sportswoman that the regime singled out as being ideally qualified to play the part of their political propaganda pawn. And the visuals could not have been better. An impeccable example of fresh-faced German youth. With her blonde braids tied back with a white band, it looked as if she had just stepped out of Nazi central casting. The press, who had been instructed not to hint at her Jewish heritage, described her as a blue-eyed, German skulled, modern female from the Rhineland who fences like the devil. The precise motives for her accepting the invitation to compete remain unclear. Was it purely the chance to compete at another Olympics? Was she fearful of what refusal would mean in practical terms for the family she had in Germany? Did she really believe, as she hinted in the coming years, that cooperating with the regime might win back her precious German citizenship? Her death through illness shortly after the war meant she never gave a definitive explanation. What is undisputed though, is that the Nazi salute she gave on the podium when receiving the silver medal in the fencing competition propelled her into the realms of infamy, casting her as a collaborator whose personal ambition overrode all moral judgment. This image of her standing alongside Eona Elek, the Jewish-Hungarian gold medalist, and Ellen Priest, the Jewish-Austrian bronze medalist, perfectly epitomizes the tangled web of deception and exploitation that ensnared all those involved in these games 
and cynically manipulated the world's perception of its hosts. What came out of the Olympics was that as soon as the last journalist had left the city, uh, the anti-Semitism was put back into place in triple force. Uh, Thirteen new edicts came out the week after the last journalist had left Berlin. As competitors, spectators and journalists departed, pre-games Berlin gradually emerged from hibernation. Overnight, the Aryans' only signs reappeared in cafe shops and restaurants, and Jews, some of who had spent the games ironically giving thanks to their protector, the patron saint Olympiad, braced themselves for the inevitable backlash of anti-Semitisms two weeks away. Copies of the savagely anti-Semitic Der Sturmer were back on public display and its pre-game slogan, when the Olympic Games are over, we beat the Jews into a pulp, was openly being chanted on the streets by mobs of Nazi stormtroopers. And inside the Ministry of Propaganda, Goebbels scrutinized cuttings from the world's press, paying particular attention to what American journalists had to say. The Nation magazine spoke of cheap lodgings, honest, friendly people where not a single Jewish head was bashed in. The New York Times correspondent left Germany with the impression of Hitler being one of the greatest political leaders in the world. Germany is much maligned and its hospitable people deserve the best the world can give them. And Goebbels must have been delighted to read stormtroopers characterized as Germany's equivalent to the RAC depicted as courteous traffic police, eager to provide directions and roadside assistance. In the light of what was to come, the naivety expressed by these journalists about the nature of the regime is staggering. Perhaps connecting with so many other nationalities and races would somehow make Germans more human again. Surely Germany has now seen for itself that all races are good. Indeed, that some, in certain respects, are even slightly superior to theirs. Keep in mind that at this point, Hitler had been in power for three and a half years. As the bunting came down and the flags were put away, the business of government resumed. The age of military conscription, which had been reintroduced by Hitler 12 months earlier, was lowered by a year, effectively increasing the size of the armed forces by 25%. Dame Le Benz, one of the industrial giants who were close to the regime, increased production of trucks and armaments and, in a forest south of Berlin, began work in their Genschagen factory in response to Hitler's demand for additional aircraft engine capacity. Goebbels, with Hitler in attendance, hosted the marriage ceremony of Diana Mitford and Oswald Mosley in his own private apartments. Over in America, Avery Brundage, now his country's official delegate to the International Olympic Committee, embarked on a tour of the states extolling the virtues of Nazi Germany, insisting that the USA had much to learn from Hitler's regime. And meanwhile, north of Berlin, Sachsenhausen, the first concentration camp to be established under the authority of Heinrich Himmler, started to fill with the political opponents, Jews, Sinti and Roma, homosexuals and other so-called undesirables that would eventually make up the more than 200,000 internees confined there over the following nine years. The 36 Olympics was just one leg of the more than a decade long process of dehumanization isolation and expulsion 
that culminated in the Holocaust. In one way, it seems entirely appropriate that the Nazis would subvert a sporting event. It somehow highlights the significance of competition to their world view. For them, humanity was defined by conflict and struggle. In particular, a ruthless racial battle where the strong and superior were destined to subdue, overwhelm and eventually eliminate groups perceived to be weaker, inferior and therefore dispensable. Twenty-four years after the Berlin extravaganza, the struggle for racial equality and inclusion played out on the Olympic arena once more. And, just like in Germany, at the centre of the storm was Avery Brundage, by now having risen to be head of the International Olympic Committee. This time the focus was on the apartheid regime in South Africa. With its policies of racial segregation in sport that mirrored Germany in the 30s. Brundage was able to deflect demands to bar them from the 1960 Games in Rome, but the chorus of protest was growing ever louder. And as the 64 Tokyo Games approached, Brundage, not for the first time, became an enthusiastic defender of a racist regime in the face of a growing boycott movement. This time, though, world opinion was strong enough to force the International Olympic Committee to expel South Africa from the Games, although Brundage was able to ensure they retained their IOC membership. And racial inequality was once more front and centre in Mexico four years later, with the iconic podium protest of African-American athletes John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Brundage was livid. The tone of his outrage is crystal clear in post-games correspondence. The actions of these Negroes was an insult to the Mexican hosts and a disgrace to the United States. Such people should not have been there in the first place. Months later, on seeing the official film of the Mexico Olympics, Brundage sought to get scenes of the raised fist protests removed. This was the same Avery Brundage who, 30 years earlier, enthusiastically promoted Lenny Riefenstahl's movie with its footage awash with Nazi salutes. There is no bigger world showcase than the Summer Olympics. They present a unique opportunity for host countries to project a positive national narrative. Propaganda? Probably. But no country since has rivaled what Germany achieved in 1936. Knowing precisely what the Nazi regime was hiding from the world puts their cynical act of deception in a league of its own. But perhaps the most alarming aspect of the entire episode is the way in which the rest of the world was so easily duped. The legacy of 36 resides in the actions of the architects of the events and their enablers but it is also in the response or lack of response of the onlooking world. And let's not kid ourselves. The signs were there if you wanted to see them. The Nuremberg laws had been in place for almost a year when Hitler stood at the podium at the opening ceremony. Wishful thinking, short-term expediency and good old national self-interest colluded to cloud rational judgment and those same signs were even clearer two years later in the wake of Hitler's annexation of Austria 
and as the nations of the world convened at the Evian conference to try and fail to find a way of helping the growing legions of Jewish refugees from Nazism. The Olympics in Berlin were the first to be broadcast live to the world on newfangled devices called television. The mind boggles at what Goebbels could have achieved in today's world of social media. And at the height of World War II, and the war was going rather badly for the German people, he called upon the people in whom he believed, and they were the astronomers. And he asked the astronomers, was, was he going to lose the war? And they said, yes, you're going to lose it. And he wanted to know, in losing the war, was he going to lose his life? And the astronomer says, yes, you're going to die. And then he wanted to know upon which day he was going to die. And they told him that you're going to die upon a Jewish holiday. And then Hitler wanted to know upon which Jewish holiday he was going to die upon. And they promptly told him that any day that you die, will be a Jewish holiday. <laughs> <laughs>